morning, everyone. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here, and thank you for all for showing up. First, I want to say a big thank you to Pastor Koju. Um, when he sent me the message, it was in September last year, and I was like, wow, Pastor plans this much in advance. And I wrote it down that X amount of months to plan for a program, because I thought I was a planner, but you know, I was just blown away. So I'm very, I'm very happy to be here. Okay. Sorry, can I get my slides? All right. Okay, so the theme for today, wealth builders, women in tech. I thought about this and I was like, okay, uh, what was the direction, right? And I thought very deeply about this. When I knew Topper was on the, uh, was part of the speaking, I knew she was going to set the context in terms of numbers. So I'm going in another direction. Um, I'm going to talk about wealth building from an operator's perspective. And I'm sure we'll all ask that, who is an operator? Because in tech, almost 80% of women or people that work in tech, you know, just small percentages are coders, right? The rest of us, we are either doing operations, customer experience, finance, and the rest of it. So who is an operator? An operator is a builder, an implementer, an executor, somebody that is always delivering on the company goals. That makes you a wealth builder. You know, whenever I think about my journey and just entrepreneurship, right, I always think that an entrepreneur is really a problem solver, whether you have a company or not, wherever you are you are an entrepreneur as long as you are solving problems. So that's my, that's the title for today. So who is a wealth builder, right? And if you are looking at money and wealth building and finance, sorry, and finance, uh, building wealth. So I wanted to start with a backdrop to even explain that what is this wealth, right? And the definition I came up with was that Wealth is just a tool in itself. It's like the fuel beneath a furnace, right? It's a means to an end. Uh, before I go to the how, I wanted to just talk about the five dimensions of wealth that I've seen. So the first dimension is the financial dimension. That's the money. So if you're in an enterprise, um, that's why we publish financial. So for instance, if you look at Amazon last year, they, make, they made over $500 billion. MTN, their ROE was about 24%. So that's financial. Then on a more personal level, it's how much you, know, you have in your bank account and all of that. That's pure financial. There's another dimension of wealth that is called social wealth. So, you know, by humans, we are all connected, right? So even as you're working, you're connected with your co-workers, you're planted in a family, you're planted with friends, family, spouse, everybody so that's social so how are you building social wealth in terms of corporate social responsibility for enterprises that's where you hear enterprises saying oh we want to affect the community where we are because that is also a dimension of wealth another dimension of wealth is time so time is a dimension of wealth meaning that as you are building yourself, building your skills, whether it's in payments, whether it's in finance, whether it's as a back-end engineer, that time you are committing is time that will give you back to be able to do whatever you want to do because at a point, time as wealth gives you the opportunity to choose in terms of what you want to do and what you don't want to do. Then of course, there's a physical wealth. Physical wealth is your well-being. If you are not okay, there's no way you can walk. There was a time I totally broke down I'm always go, go, go. For a month, I, I was in the clinic. There was nothing I could do. You can't build wealth if, physic if, you're, if you're not physically fit and your well-being is not there. The last one, but not the least. Sorry. <laughs> the last, but not the least, is the spiritual wealth. So the spiritual wealth is we're all connected to something. So that's your core of your beliefs. So what gives you that connection, the peace of mind? What gives you that internal contentment? So those are the dimensions of wealth, okay? So if you didn't know before, at least you know what the dimensions of wealth are. So 
So I wanted to ask, based on this knowledge of the dimensions of wealth, what kind of wealth are you building? Okay? You don't have to answer me now. You can answer at the end. But in terms of the how, I've classified it into five. So the first, um, the first one is purpose. I'll talk about discipline and structure. I'll talk about relationships, adaptability and resilience and customers in terms of knowing your customers. So the first how is purpose. So the first how is purpose. Sorry, I don't know why this keeps going off. So I wanted to talk about purpose, both on an individual and an enterprise perspective. Now, when I started my career, I remember two, three years in, I've always been like, an, you know, I, want, I always wanted the best. I always wanted to be top of the class. I've always been that person. But I wasn't really sure of what I was going to, in terms of my career, how it would go. So this was in my third year, and I remember one of, we had, we got a, I was in management consulting, and we had a job, it was a very big job. Two, a bank bought over another bank, so you can imagine, so they had to combine the banks. I wasn't on that project. Um, our office was in Ikoi, and I used to live on the mainland. So me, I was just waiting for five o'clock to, it's for, for the clock to just be five, so I'll run away and go and go home on time before traffic started to build. So when it was 4.45, I remember one of the senior managers called me and was like, Buddy, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. She said, Buddy, just quickly help us join the team and help us format, you know, these files and everything. So it was this Excel sheet, right? And on the Excel sheet, it was just, it wasn't even names of people like Bode and Kebe, Tope, no. It was just positions, right? And then on the columns, we now had, so they were, um, the Excel sheet was going to help to say who stays and who goes. So it was just, okay, does this person have this certification? Does this person have this degree? And people were being caught just based on the, um, if they had that credential or not. As if it wasn't bad enough, I was just thinking that, wow, these people will wake up and they won't have a job again. That if an alarm bell went off in my head. And then to make it, we were there overnight, maybe up to until five o'clock. So they got it, we, I got all the letters. I was supposed to deliver letters <laughs> I was just to read these letters, imagine, to branches before they woke up in the, you know, the next day. So I got my own letters. I was going to about five northern states. So I got home, five o'clock. My mom was like, where are you going? That should I help you write your resignation letter? I didn't know what they planned, everything. I was like, it's okay. So I had my bath. The cab waited for me, took me to the airport. When I got to the first place in Kano, you know, I was supposed, the instruction was very clear. I was supposed to go through the back and just drop the letters. So as I was dropping the letters, I'll look into the, <laughs> into the thing, I'll be like, gosh, these people, and you know, if back then, once you get that letter, once you get the thing, it's the end, right? You are shut down, you are off in the bank. And I was just looking at this, you know, I went to all the five, uh, five states, at some point, I'll get on an card, I'll go to the next branch, I was just dropping letters, I was like, is this my life? And everything. And then, on my way back in the plane, it just occurred to me that this um, place I'm working, it's not because I'm Bode or I'm all that, right? I'm just like a skill, right? And that was where I started to say that I was going to do everything that I needed to do to make sure that I remained relevant. That relevancy is the currency of my career. And I started, in fact, when I did this MBA that she was talking about, I was heavily pregnant with, the, um, with twin boys. I would write that paper. I'll pay for so I was always mapping and plotting and saying how do I differentiate myself that thing left a really big mark on me and it was like the alarm bell that went off in my head that enabled me to start chatting my purpose from a career perspective now for enterprises right what I just want to say is as a founder if it's your company you need to at the early stage look for people that have purpose. Yes, you bring them in, you pay them. But, but when, you, when you are interviewing those first set of people, they have to be people of purpose. Because when you have your company, the crispiness and clarity is for you as the founder. And it was the crispiness and, and clarity of what the founder told me that made me even make the big jump because I could clearly see what was being said. 
And that is the anchor that will keep waking you up even when things go bad. So purpose, very, very critical. So I'll go to the second one. The second thing in terms of build, wealth building, in terms of the how, is to know your customer. So knowing your customer, I'm sure, you know, a, a lot of things have been said in terms of, oh, you have to co-create with them. But I'm saying it again. You co-create with them. You understand your customers. You understand what they want. Everything and all your vision is designed around the customer. But in terms of the key things I wanted to say here is that when we start businesses, right, we always, we're always so close to those first set of customers. We know everything that they need. But when money starts coming in, we start, you know, ignoring them. So it's a lifetime approach in terms of wealth building when it comes to customers. And you shouldn't just focus on the top tier customers that bring you money because if you don't take care of those 80% that make all the noise, you'll be in trouble because it will distract you from fulfilling, you know, your, your objectives to even the ones at the top. And if you look at countries too, the countries that take care of the most vulnerable, they are always very forward-looking, great um, countries. So design a framework that takes care of them. I'm sure a lot of us, if you bought a ticket on BA, even if your ticket is the least economy ticket, if you have an issue, they will respond to you as if you are the only customer. On Amazon, they will respond to you, right? So you have to design something, a framework, and I'll talk, when I get to um, discipline and structure, I'll talk a bit more about that in terms of how are you taking care of um, the customers as well? I remember one time there was a very top customer that we, that we had. And it was one of our, in fact, we held that customer with all our hearts in the fintech I worked. And they called me. We had an issue. Settlements hadn't gone in for some time. And the person said, we'll yank you off because most companies they usually have like a fail over. They will have a second person they can drive their traffic to. We'll cut you off by five o'clock. I'm so customer driven, you know, even apart from all the work I had done on customer that I left the office, I got a hoodie, covered my face, there was traffic between Lekki, I was going to, the bank was in Ikoi. Do you know I got on an Okada because I had only two, two hours, went to the bank and told them that this issue had to be solved. The client was on the mainland, I took a cab straight to the mainland in their office. So when the woman saw me, the director was like, oh, but the idea is fixed. I said, you told me you would yank me up at, at five o'clock. So I'm here, you know. The money didn't come in at five, but because she saw me, she saw everything. So everything is about your customer because the customer is, without customers, there's no revenue. Are you guys with me? So the other thing I wanted to share, under know your customer is, I know a lot of people say, oh, wow, fintechs make all the magic. But in the beginning phase, before you get the first people to bet on you, trust me, there were days that 24-7 behind the scene, you guys will say you transferred money, will say we just did a new product. Everybody will be happy that yeah, but some people were not sleeping. Behind, you see instant payment, but we're using tokens to move money from one account to the other, doing all the things that needed to be, to be done behind to make sure that the transactions don't fail. I've had, you know, banks that, you know, just come to the office on Saturdays just to make sure that limits don't fill. So you start that way, you show yourself and then they expand your limits, right? And then you now have rails that can make you sleep overnight. So the customer is about everything, okay? I'll go to the next one in terms of the theme. That's adaptability and resilience. This is about understanding your business model, right? And the step-by-step -step process for generating profitability. When I work with founders, they usually have great ideas, but when you ask them that, okay, how will money come out of this? They will start saying, okay, this is what I'm thinking. So as you are thinking about the idea, you are thinking, what's the step-by-step -step process? How does money come out? What's the revenue? What comes to me? What's my own portion? Those are the things that are very required. So if you had an idea, for instance, that you are building an app, and you want one million people to come on that app. You know, that's the goal. But the goal is like this. But to get here, there are many things. So one of the key things for world builders is that flexibility and adaptability to know that things can change. There was a, a situation that we had that regulator just came in the morning and they gave, there was one regulation and next thing, 
a whole revenue stream that we're so proud of became shut down. So what do you do? Your goal is still 1 million customers, right? You go back to the drawing table and you say, what else do we do about this? And then we created our own product and the product took off. All of these things, it's, you know, it's just saying, how dogged are you, right? What is your goal? Remember what I said about the purpose? What's that anchor and what's driving all of that? Another example, and I think this example is one of the things that really changed the course of, you know, some of the things I did in terms of my career as well. I don't know how many of you remember when we had 88 banks, right? And then Solido came and said, oh, they changed uh, minimum capital and the banks became 20, 25 then. And one of the things that we did in the firm with, um, was that people that will win will be, win on the basis of service. That's banks now. So we started this banking survey. So for the banking survey, it was really just getting information from customers. What do you think about this bank? What do you think about that bank? So I remember after the second or third year, the person that was leading it was leaving. And in the pool, they were like, oh, who's going to take this? Me, everybody was saying, because it was a very, you can imagine all the questionnaires on your table. You had to go, interview corporates. It was real big. And it wasn't really a money-making project. So you still had to do a money-making project, right? And the thing fell on my head. As usual, I was like, why is this thing falling on my head? And I remember one of my... Stop, you know, go there, do the right thing, just go through the process, learn and shine. And I remember these bigs now became, so you can imagine we're ranking the banks. So when we go to the banks, the people that don't do well, they'll start saying, this methodology is wrong. What is this? This methodology is bad. In the fifth year, they'll say this methodology is bad. But we stayed on it. We didn't stop, right? When they ask us questions, we'll go back, we'll come with our facts and figures, we'll tell them we kept at it. We expanded it from corporate to retail. We did the work. We stayed on it. And after some time, the banks had no, there was no other person gathering that sort of data. The banks now started reinventing their performance management around when we published um, the banking survey results. Not just that, it became like people's KPIs were being set. We stayed on it. This was not in the first, second, third. It was almost in the sixth, seventh year. He gained acceptance. You know, I looked at it again. And I spoke with my partner. We got a budget. We replicated it across 14 countries in Africa. So it's just always saying, I'm here, but it's not the best place. You keep looking at facts and figures that makes you reinvent and take things forward. There was an opportunity that came. And we said, we've been collecting data. How do we make this bigger? How do we make this a service line? So there was a training in South Africa. I got that training, went there. In fact, at the end of the training, I'm sure people were wondering, what's wrong with this girl? Because all the things on Persona, I was bringing everything down, packed everything inside my box. <laughs> when I came, I called all my team members. I said, food has landed. So they all came to the office. I bought food. And we started looking at everything. And we just needed one bank to take a chance on us. And we did our first customer value proposition project. And that became like the standard, right? So beyond doing survey, that they're paying you 5 million, 10 million, you do a bigger project, that they're paying you 60 million, 70 million. You understand what I'm saying? But it's the doggedness. So sometimes some people will question, what is this product? But you know what it is, right? So you stay on it. OK. <laughs> So the next one I want to talk about is structure and discipline. So ideas are always everywhere. So as you know, I'm talking to us as women as well. So when the ideas are here, it's whoever takes the idea and implements, right? That gets, that is a well builder and builds something around that. So in my finding, I found out that there are three categories of people. There are people that get the ideas, they don't do anything about it. But there are people that get the ideas and they're able to execute those ideas for themselves. But there's a third category. They get the ideas, they're able to execute for themselves, and they're able to get other people to execute as well. So on your own, if you have a business and you are recruiting, these are the sort of people that you need to bring in so that they cover you in areas that you're not very strong in um, as well. So you quickly identify them, and when you bring them in, you give them space to be able to do what they want to do without getting on their nerves. Um, so, there are, you know, there, in, there are some founders I was also working with, right? If they send you their board reports, 
6 o'clock, May 31st, every day. The consistency, 6 o'clock, April 31st. You already know the people that have structure and discipline. Discipline is everything. So set rules up for yourself and let your word be your bond. Personal discipline across many fronts, right, will save you um, a lot as a wealth builder. The last point, but not the least, is um, I want to talk about is relationships. So relationships, meaning who are your stakeholders, your family, your spouse, your employees, right? One thing I'll say is that for relationships, is either all of these people, even your employees, it's for me, don't burn bridges. There was an issue that happened. You know, imagine I just joined um, FinTech in uh, October 2019. Then in 20, sorry, 2018, two months down the line, I was at home. I was still sleeping in the house. Next thing, my phone was buzzing. That body, our name is all over the internet. Tell customers are getting credited twice. This, that, okay. I've done all sorts of things, but I didn't even know what I, I did. Of course, I told myself, I said, yes, I'm on my way, I'm coming. I had no idea what you were talking about. So they now said it was double debit. I hadn't dealt with that kind of issue before. So I called my friend, um, Nadine. Nadine had done strategy for her bank over a period of time, and we had worked together. She was like, call Tayo. Tayo used to be like the head of operations for that bank. Tayo had also left the bank and had her own practice. And I called her. She was like, but they come over. She quickly dressed up, came, I went to her office, and she started drawing like the diagram of what I needed to do, what it meant. She started connecting me to people that were going to help me. So I went back to the office because I'm a problem solver, right? And that's the way my team sees me. So I got to the team, we went through the entire thing, and the next thing, you know, the next time it happened, we documented it. But it was that relationship, right? Because I nurtured those relationships. I didn't burn those bridges. That's why they're there. And then the other um, points I want to drop is, don't be transactional in your dealing with people. Um, I remember my, my sister-in-law came to me and she was like, oh, in their church, they are trying to build like a data system for people and all of that. Like, Can I come and present? I was very busy. But the thing is, it doesn't matter if it's a small stage, if it's a big stage, I always prepare for everything as if I'm speaking to a president. So I called the person that led data. She had been on, um, she had been on maternity leave and you know, she, she doesn't like public speaking. I was like, it's a smaller team. You don't have to be worried. We'll both present together. And we went there, did a fantastic job. I wasn't going to charge them anything. And then they were so impressed that they took like the whole presentation and everything and gave it to their pastor. So the next thing I was on, the pastor called me to thank me. And then he connected me with somebody else that was building a hotel. So he said, oh, the guy just needs to know, you know, how to do this and all of that. So I went there, met the guy. I wanted to charge him, but, you know, because I'm like, this is not, this is another relationship. But he said, oh, but they have been trying to do this for some time, this period. So I worked with them. When I had time, I went there, did a small session for them. And trust me, when that hotel opened, anything that happens in that hotel, the guy always calls me and says, oh, buddy, and the kind of people I've met, I didn't even know who he was at that point. Just some of the things that have happened, people, some of the people I've sat to eat with, right? Just because of some of those things I, I, I did, you know, it's based on relationships. So don't be transactional um, in your dealing uh, with people so that you can always leverage a relationship. So I'll begin to try to close now. Um, I wanted to speak to us as women and just drop a few points in terms of what I've also seen wealth builders do. As women, there's a lot that we do and there's a lot that we know. So one of the first things I want to say is be courageous in the things that you know. So if your area, I remember when I started in customer then, you know, I was building customer any small stage in church. We started a business school, I'll be like I'm presenting. Eight o'clock, I was always there. I'll present because you can make mistakes with a smaller crowd. If they say they are teaching, I'll be there. So be courageous and build on what you already know. That is what wealth builders do. Be confident in who you are. And it happens all the time. When you talk to a man that needs to give you a deliverable, he'll be like, buddy, I know the deliverable is not complete, but trust me, it's the best thing that you've ever seen. I'm like, but you've not even completed the deliverable. How do you know it's best? I've not even reviewed it. He said, trust me, I know what I'm doing. 
But if it's a woman, they'll come and say, yes, this is not, I didn't, I didn't be the one that you've done. Step up, puff up your chest and say that I did this, right? Do you understand? Step up and say, I did it because you actually did it. I know I'm saying this now, you know, it took a bit of time, but you have to start saying this is what you, what you did. If you go for meetings with founders, you know, men can be very, oh, this is where I've arrived. You two, sit at the top of the table, do you understand? Don't sit behind. Open the seats, you know, say what you want to say. Practice your handshakes. Use the mirror. My husband used to laugh at me because I was always using the mirror. I was also always using my friends. I was always calling them, oh, what do you think about this? Before you see my presentation, I've shown many people, what do you think? You know, so use, use what it is. I remember one time on this bank project that we did, um, there were two of us leading, two of us were directors, me and one other guy. But the days we have board meetings or presentations, when I walk, so we had like a team of about 70 people. Whenever I walk into those spaces, everybody will be like, ah, we have a presentation today because from my top to my bottom, I am ready. Like they'll be like, buddy, there's a presentation today because I will show up then my own, I would have gone to everybody. You know, he would be like, oh, all my slides are ready. My mind would be like, eh, me too, my own is ready. <laughs> you know, but I've done. So some of the skills we have as women bring everything um, to fore. Then be the change that you want to see. So as you advance in your career, I remember when I also, um, what do you call it? When I got married, I was waiting for children, and I wanted to leave work that, this work, let me go and focus on baby making. But my, my partner then was like, buddy, okay, go for one month, right? And this was after many years, after I've shown the value, I've, you know, I've, I'm always showing value. Remember what I said happened to me from those letters of doom? I went to drop. And she said, go for one month. So I went for one month to go and stay with my husband. My husband was already afraid because he was like, oh God, this girl that doesn't have work, she's going to see everything and start stressing my life. But, you know, when I got, when, I, when, when that... Sorry, what was I saying? <laughs> anyway, so what I'm trying to say is, she encouraged me not to give up, right? And after like, I didn't even stay up to a month. I called, I said, please, this is my three months sabbatical. I don't want it again. You know, I came back to work and then just found a way to make it work. So when you get into those areas of leadership, if it's a wink, spotlighting the people that did the work, giving the people thumbs up, making the change. I, I did a strategy retreat. I was like, for this strategy retreat, we're doing it in Ghana. We're going to have child minders because people are like, I'm not going to come because no child. We make sure they can participate. So be the change. The last thing is offense and your tribe. So the example I was giving about, you know, this baby making thing, you know, there was a time my mother-in-law would call. She'd be like, buddy, where are you? <laughs> I'll be like, I'm in New Zealand or I'm in Sydney. She'd be like, where is, where is your husband? I'll be like, oh, he's in New Orleans because our work was taking us apart. So in her mind, she'd be wondering that, how would these ones give me children <laughs> this way and all of that? So in my mind, I was like, I'll just block everybody from my phone. I'll not talk to anybody. And they should leave me and all of that. That me and my husband understand what we want to do. But one day, you know, the Holy Spirit ministered to me and he said, buddy, if you put yourself in that same shoe, you'll be asking the same question. So I went back to her. I apologize. I was just more open. I, I think that string and shackle was just, you know, just escaped from my heart. So today I tell you that even up to our oil, the beans, everything in terms of food, because she lives in Ilori, she's, she's the one that does everything for me. As in, I don't even have to worry. So that part of my, you know, everything is sorted. The other thing is, as women, the amount of gusto that we put in work, in hiring, in your own house, do the same. You are the stellar job description person. Do the same thing for the people that you are hiring in the house. So the same amount of excellence that you do is the same amount of excellence um, that you also do for your house as well. So in closing, <laughs> I wanted to leave you with this operating model. So leading into your operating model. So as a woman, just some things that you ask yourself I think the most critical thing that I've learned about myself is also my energy. So my cycles of energy. So when, so when I pump and when I know that, you know, I have to relax. So the pumping time will be the leverage for me when I can't pump. So what wealth are you building? Thank you very much.